Acts chapter 3 verse 1. You should be there by now. And the scripture reads as thus. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple. Thank you, Jesus. At the hour of prayer. The ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have. <laughs> Glory to God. See, <laughs> I got to go through this text, but some of y'all been crying about what you don't have, but I need you to just change your perspective and say, I may not have this, but what I do have. Yeah. Pastor Tammy, it ain't about what I don't have. It's about what I do. Somebody ought to shout what you still got left. My God. Yeah. No. He said, I don't have no silver. I have no silver and I have no gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. For a few moments, if you pray for me and Holy Spirit empower me, I want to preach on the subject, no experience required. No experience required. You may be seated. Thank you, God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Whew, glory to God. Y'all came to have church today. I, I see. Hallelujah. Clearly said, Pastor sabbatical, but we not. We here. We in, we in the Lord's house. We in the Lord's house. And so as we approach this text of focus, we see the apostle Peter and John going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And this is significant because this signifies that, that even in their post-Pentecostal culture, there is still a great need for the continual discipline of prayer. I have to do due diligence to this text to tell you that while the Holy Spirit has come and while we do right now as in the church age have the present indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is still a necessity for the consistent discipline of prayer. Jesus says men ought to always pray and not faint. That doesn't mean you pray 24-7. That means that you remain prayerful. That means that prayer becomes a part of your lifestyle. That means even if you stop right now and say God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hand we all be fed. Thank you Lord for daily bread. Amen. That's still a discipline. And so the first thing that, that, that Luke, who is the writer here, wants us to know that the apostles, even though they, they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, even though the ascended Christ has, has descended through the power of the Holy Ghost and has animated his church to do great things, they are still consistent to go to prayer. It says it's the ninth hour, so in our time, this will be about three o'clock in the afternoon. And, and, and they, they, they said, bruh, let's go pray because that's what we do. We go pray. And so I, I, I want to pause right here and just encourage somebody that, that you make sure that, number one, you are praying, but then also make sure you're not praying by yourself. You, you, you need to have companionship in prayer. And the reason why you need to have companionship in prayer is because sometimes we, we, can, we, can, we can get full of ourselves before God in prayer. I know, I, know, I know we don't, 
you know, we may not feel that, but sometimes you need somebody to keep you grounded in prayer. Because sometimes we can give God stuff that we know ain't the truth, but it sounds good coming off our tongue. But if you have somebody who, that you, who you are accountable to, they can even keep you accountable in your prayer life. Because some of us pray for things that we know we don't have the capacity to have. I, I'm, not, I'm not hanging there, but I just need you to understand that, that it is imperative that we continue in the discipline of prayer. Uh, we, 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 we've, given, we've given our teams the month off, and so even, even though we're not having our power on, on, fr on Saturday at 9 a.m., you should be in such a discipline that anywhere you are, Saturday at 9 a.m., like... The church should be praying. Let me, let me, uh, let me, it's prayer time. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a Muslim. I'm, I, 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 I've, I've studied Islam. I, I've read the Quran. And, and, I, and I honor the fact that wherever they are in the world, when it's the time, when the multiple times of prayer do today, they will stop where they are. Listen, I remember I was at Jiffy Lube once. That's, okay, that's L.A. That's, that's, like, that's like, you know, five. You know what I mean? That, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a place where you go to get your oil changed. I'll never forget this. I, I was getting my, my Chrysler Pacifica uh, uh, oil changed. And, and while I was waiting to get, get, get my oil changed, I seen a brother bring a little mat out of his car. And, and he rolled it on the grass right in front of Jiffy Lube. And he bowed down and he began. And to pr turn his face to Mecca and pray to Allah. And I, and I sat there as, with my in and out in my hand. It was a double-double. Don't judge me. It was animal style. Mind your business. Uh, the, the, the reality is I was convicted in that moment because it, even, even in something as mundane as getting your oil changed, my, my Muslim brother said, if it's the hour of prayer, I will stop, turn my face toward Mecca and pray to Allah. My question to the believer is, is prayer built into your schedule? Because I know some, you know, some of us, we don't say yes to anything before we check our schedule. But I wonder if we look at your schedule, is prayer built in there? Do, do, do you have prayer built? These, these brothers, this is three o'clock in the afternoon. They, they could be doing many things at this point in time. But because they had a discipline of prayer, they said, wait a minute. Oh, it's three. Come on in. Let's, let's head to the temple. We got to go have time of prayer. Which teaches us that we, in, in having the discipline of prayer, not only must we have a, a scheduled time of player, prayer, but we also must have a structured place of prayer. I'm not saying that you can only pray at some place. And, and, and I, I thank God again for our pastor and our leader. I remember last year, and, and we, we, we began to plan for the conference, and we said, you know, what? one of the features for this year's conference, we want to do a prayer room. And, we, and, and, and it agreed with Mother Mary's spirit and the prayer team. They came, and, and they saturated the place, and they did it. And, and we, it was only supposed to be a conference feature. But then, then it became November, and it was like, no, I'll keep it. And then it was like, surely it's December now. You know, we, you know, we got to go back to school. And so surely we're going we're gonna to avail this classroom. The pastor was like, no, nah, keep it. And then, 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 then we got to the new year. We're like, well, surely it's 2023. We need to do something else with this space. And he said, no, 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 we're going to keep it. And, and the, the reality is, is that not only must you have a, a practice of a time of prayer, but you ought to have a place of prayer. You ought to have a place that you can go that, that your family and even the enemy know that you don't mess with me here. I take sanctuary here. This is where I talk to my God. I'm moving here, but even in times of war, there was a principle called sanctuary. It was a war principle called sanctuary. And even the opposing forces, these could be marauders from a different land. If you took sanctuary, they would wait outside the house of God. Stay their weapons. Because even their enemy honored their time of prayer. So as, as they go to prayer, on their way to the temple, something interesting happens. And now I have to insert something that may bother some of you anal retentive people in the room. I got to insert something that may bother you people who only live by your schedule. 
as they were on their way to their scheduled prayer time, as they were on their way to their scheduled prayer time at their scheduled or, or their, their appointed prayer place, they were interrupted. Now, now I, got, I, got, I got to pause here because some of us are too saved to be interrupted. Some of us, not, not you, not you, not you, maybe somebody you know, but not you, not you. Some of us are too saved to be interrupted, even if it's God. God, I can't do your will right now. I got to go pray to you. God, don't stop me. I got, I, I'm on my way to go worship you. Don't, don't interrupt my. The Bible says that as they were going to the hour of prayer at the temple of prayer, they were interrupted by this lame man. And the lame man begins to ask for alms. And, and, and Luke is descriptive to say that not only is he lame, but he's been lame all of his life. He's been lame all of his life. He's been carried all of his life. And he lays at the same place every day. He's always been lame. He's always been carried, and he's always been at the same place. I believe God that there is a spirit of change in the atmosphere. I believe that there is a shift in the room. I believe that shift atmosphere is happening right now. And so I got to pause and tell somebody, I don't care how long you've been there, change is coming. Wow. I need, I need, I need some, listen, listen, and here's the thing I love about it. You ain't got to find change. I hear God saying change is about to find you. Woo! I'm going <laughs> to He says, I need, I need arms, sir, sir, please, please, sir, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, brother, pastor. Excuse, 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 excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, I, I see you going. To, I see you going to prayer. But before before you go into prayer, because if anybody should be generous, it should be the people that are going. He was strategic. He knew it. Like, hey, listen, I know them church folk give. You know what I mean? Church, they generous. They generous. They, 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 you know, they, they generous. So, so I'm, I'm going to sit right here by the gate, beautiful. I'm going to sit right here by, by, by the entryway where they go in to pray. And so as they go in to pray and they go in to seek God, uh, may, maybe, maybe God will move their heart to put a little change in my hand. And he says, sir, I need arms. And clearly this was something he had been doing for a long time. And as he has been doing this day after day after day after day, the Bible says he did it on the right day. And he did it on the right day with the right people. And the Bible says that as he asked for arms for them, Verse 4 says, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, here it is, look at us. Now, here, here's, here's the first principle that I need you to grab a hold to. I need you to grab a hold of this quickly. If you are going to see the miraculous take place in your life, if you are going to see God shift some things in your life and move you in a new direction, you are going to need focus. If you're taking notes, I need you to write this down now. If I want to see the miraculous in my life, I must have focus. Peter and John says, listen, we're about to do something, but before we even do what God is empowering us to do, I need you to look at us. Look her, look her. Focus in on me. Focus right here. I know there are a lot of things going on in your life, but look at Jesus. I know there are a lot of folk telling you what you can't do and where you can't go, but I need you to focus on Jesus. I know there's a lot of people saying what you're not going to be and what you cannot accomplish, but I wish I had 88 people in here that said right in this 
this season, I'm going to focus on Jesus. I know what the landlord is saying. I know what the mortgage officer is saying. I know what the ex is saying. I know what everybody else is saying, but I believe God. So right here, I'm going to focus on, doctor, I appreciate your prognosis, but excuse me as I focus on Jesus. Family, I know what y'all think, and I know what y'all said is a curse, and what y'all said everybody going to die with, but excuse me as I focus on Jesus. Past, I appreciate you for everything that you did for me, but excuse me as I focus on Look at us. Look, look at us. I, I, so, so, some, of, some of you are going to leave here and your whole life is going to change because you're going to decide just to focus on God. You're going to decide to focus on the things of God. They, that, that lame man would have never received the miracle if he looked past them to ask for some alms for somebody else. All oh, these brothers are trying to have a conversation, man. I'm trying to get these coins. Excuse me, brother. Excuse me. Uh, alms. 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 He, he, he says, I need you to know that there is a necessity for focus. Everybody say one more time. Focus. And then as we go down through the text, the apostles replied to him. They say, listen, I don't have silver, nor do I have gold. Here it is. I, I'm not hanging here. This, I'm not trying to do a whole leadership talk, but I just need to double park right here, put my hazard lights on, and talk to a few Peter and Johns in the room. I ain't even go parallel park. I'm just going to double park right here. The, the, be very careful. Be very careful that you only give what God has called you to give. I'm going to set somebody free right now. Somebody, so, 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 some, somebody, somebody thinking of using a credit card right now to do something for somebody that, that, that they can't even afford to do, but because they want to be good Christians. Pause right now. If God didn't tell you to do it, don't do it. Now listen, listen. Now, now if, if, we are, if we are contextually true, if we are contextually true to the text, the Bible says that, that as, as the apostles started to build the ministry, that the people of God, you just look at the in last chapter, chapter 2, that the people of God began to put money at the apostles' feet. The Bible says that people begin to liquidate their assets and give money to the apostles. So it's not that the apostles were broke. The apostles didn't have the anointing to give them money. Don't miss what I just said. Don't miss what I just said. The apostles had money, but money wasn't what God called them to give to him. Because see, in actuality, money wouldn't go fix his lame problem. Yeah. And some of y'all think that money is going to solve your problem. No, money not your problem. You got a discipline problem. Money not your problem. You got a talk too much problem. Money not your problem. You... I'm, I'm not, I, this, I mean, no offense, respectfully, respectfully. Money is not the issue. And so you can only give what God calls you to give. And even if you have it, the question is, God, what are you calling me to give to them? What, what are you calling me to give to this lame man? He said, man, I ain't got no silver and gold for you. I ain't got no silver and gold for you. He says, but what I have, I give it to you. And so he says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Listen to me. This statement signifies that the miraculous power that was exhibited by Peter and John, listen to me now, it was not intrinsic, but it was delegated. Because many times, many times as we engage in charismatic ministry and, and, and as, and as we, we move in the prophetic and, and, and we believe for Pentecostal moves of God, listen to me, I, I'm, I'm probably the most Pentecostal person in this church. Seriously. Listen, I will dance and speak in tongues all day if pastor let me. But at the same time, we have to be true to what is in the text. 
We have to be true to what is real. So what this means is, is that in this moment, when, when he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, this was not Peter healing a man at will. This was Peter mm, being delegated by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ to do what the Holy Spirit empowered him to do. You don't have no power to heal folk willy-nilly. You can't just start talking stuff and, and claiming houses and claiming cars. Go down to the dealership, walk around Alexis three times and say it's mine in Jesus' name. Fool, you're crazy. But if the Lord say so, Listen, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I promise you, I'm not that guy. But I remember there was a prophet of God that came to my church. And the prophet of God said, man of God, God told me while I was sitting there and you were ministering that you and your wife need to go and get the car. And we said, well, this, this woman crazy. <laughs> this woman crazy. I'm not that dude. I'm not about to go walk around the car. And, and so the next time we seen her, she said, man of God, have you got your car yet? I was like, no, girl, ain't nobody. What are you talking about? I said, man of God, the Holy Spirit told me you need to go get that car. Listen to me. I went and got the car and it was waiting for for us. Y'all, I can't make this stuff up. It was waiting for us, not because it was my will or her will, but because it was the will of God. You can't say it unless God didn't already said it. This, this was not in, Peter and John did not have intrinsic power. They were not sorcerers. They were not wizards. XPO Patronum. Paralysius, Rhizius. And if we're not careful, we will begin to follow church trends of witches and wizards. They call themselves prophets and, and apostles, but they're really witches and warlocks and wizards spinning incantations. Because the enemy knows how to bless too. The enemy can read checkbooks. This is why the apostles had to rebuke the girl outside the temple who would say, these are men of God. These are men of God. I prophesied that they're men of God. They said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Because she wasn't prophesying from the Holy Ghost. She was prophesying from the dark side. He says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so I need you to understand, people of God, there is no intrinsic power in us. Amen. It is delegated power. Now watch this. But if the Holy Ghost come, whoo, but if the Holy Ghost use you, and see, this is why we got to be open and available. This is why we got to be empty vessels. This is why you got to empty yourself of yourself. This is why you got to get pride up off you. This is why you got to get offense up off you. This is why you got to start forgiving because some of you haven't been used by God because you're too full of unforgiveness to be full of the Holy Ghost so that the Holy Ghost can use you to do a miracle in your family. You can't heal your daddy if you won't forgive. Give them. You can't prophesy to your mama if you won't let her. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Now listen, I got I to stop here because we, we know that the writer of this text is Luke. Luke was a physician by trade, which means that when he looked at this scenario, he, he spoke of it, of course, according to his miraculous properties, but he also spoke of it according to its scientific properties. So Luke says, when he grabbed him and lifted him, he says, there was a rejoining of his feet and his ankles. 
Oh, don't miss this. Luke is literally saying, I, I was right there. I seen it. I seen it. Everything. I, I have to give you the prognosis. I have to tell you what happened scientifically. Because they, they prophesied. They spoke the word of healing over him as the Holy Spirit empowered them. But as they spoke in the spirit, something happened in the physical. God. Please don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. God is not just esoteric spiritual spookiness. When you say it in the spirit, it got to happen on earth. That's why Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in the heaven. You got to believe that whatever God said in your spirit, it's got to happen in your life. I wish I had somebody that said, I'm not just praying this thing for my health. I'm believing God. If he said it in the spirit, I'm going to see it in my account. If he said it in the spirit, I'm going to see it at my address. If he said it in the spirit, I'm going to see it in my marriage. Is there anybody in here beside me that says, I got to see it for myself? Luke says, this is miraculous. I heard what Peter said, but when after Peter spoke, after John spoke, the ankle and the foot began to rejoin to itself. And not only did it begin to rejoin itself, but there was strength therein, which literally means that muscles begin to immediately form around feet and ankles that had never been operable. <sighs> I'm about to leave y'all. I'm about to leave y'all. Uh, verse 8 then now it says and leaping up he didn't creep up you know that old grandpa creep up you know no 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 the bible says that he leaped up now 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 that's that's not impressive for those of you who've been walking your whole life but when I began to study this in, 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 in Acts chapter 4 verse 22, Acts chapter 4 verse 22 tells us that the man was 40 years old. So that means that for 40 years, his legs, his feet, and his ankles were inoperable, which means that they had no muscle whatsoever. And so even if, 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 if he had the ability to reverse his paralysis, he would still have to go through, according to my studies, at least six to eight months of physical therapy in order to build up the muscles of his foot, leg, and ankle. And after he went through six months of physical therapy, he then would have to go through neural passages that would then send signal from his brain to his leg to flex and must and brain waves from his brain to his ankle and to the foot so this should have taken a long time but I wish I had 78 people in here who said when God shows up what takes a long time can be done in no time I don't know about you, but I serve a God who don't need 12 steps. I serve a God who all he needs is once. Is there anybody in here that says, I believe God that he will do it in quick time? Let me break this thing down for you before I leave you. The first thing that the scripture says is that the man leaped. He leaped, which means that God through, through, through the work of the apostles gave him immediate strength. Uh, where, where, where my bodybuilders in the room? Where my, where my people that work out, that take care of themselves? I see you, you buff. Come on, you sit there, look at you. You can preach to us better than I can to say it took time to build them muscles. It took time to get that calf, to, you know. It took time to get the, you know. But God gave this man immediate strength. God said, I ain't got time for physical therapy. I need him to be healed now. And so the first thing that God gave him was strength. And I don't know who needs to hear this in here, but you will know that it is the miraculous move of God. Because in areas where you have been previously weak, 
I need you to check again and you will begin to see strength where there used to be weakness y'all not going to shout yet because you ain't checked but there's going to be a couple of people in here that's going to be shouting on their way to their car because they're going to check where they used to be weak and they're going to feel the strength of the Lord rising up I wish somebody would say I feel strength rising but not only did he leap but the Bible says that immediately after he leapt immediately after he leaped immediately after he leaped the Bible says he stood because see there's a lot of us that'll leap but we'll leap and fall back down kind of like we come to church and we're real excited in the sanctuary and we shouting but then when we go back to the same circumstances we I was, I was just leaping I was just leaping at Cornelia but then I the Bible says not only did he leap then the Bible says that he stood number two I'm moving I'm moving Number two, he stood. So he leaps, then he stands. And, and, and the leap represented the strength of the Lord, but the standing represented the stability of the Lord. I need somebody to understand and hear your unstable days are coming to an end. Your days of flipping back and forth. You want to be married, now you don't want to be married. You want to live right and then you want to act righteous. I hear God saying, I'm about to cancel all of that stuff. You're going to be of one mind. You either going to be with me or against me. Is there anybody in here that says, God, I want some stability in my life. I don't want to keep jumping back and forth. I don't want to keep rehashing old decisions. I'm making up in my mind that I'm going to be stable. Lord, give me your stability. Lord, lift me up and let me stand my faith on Yo, I got listen I <laughs> he said I'm going to give you stability the man not only did he leap, but he stood, which means God is going to stabilize you. I need somebody to give God praise just for 22 seconds because he's about to stabilize you. He's about to stabilize your marriage. He's about to stabilize your business. He's about to stabilize your education. He's about to stabilize your mental state. He's about to stabilize your emotions. You're not going to be erratic and happy one day, depressed the next day. But I hear God saying, I'm about to stabilize you. I'm about to put you in a stable place. Your friends going to be able to see that sis not tripping no more. She didn't finally got rid of that negro because she's stable now her brother is finally starting to do things the right way because he's stable now somebody just shout lord make me stable and as i prepare to leave you not only did he leap which represented the fact that god instantly gave him muscles strength but he stood which meant that God began to stabilize his engagement even in gravity come on y'all see babies even when they get enough strength to walk uh, it, it's still it's still a struggle to stand but but I, I, I God gives this man stability but not only does he give him stability the final thing he gives him, and this is where somebody ought to really give God glory, is that the Bible says that he began to walk. The best, uh, the, the, the best uh, a therapist in the world will need six to eight weeks with someone who formerly wrestled with paralysis in order to get them back walking with a slow paced stride. Six to eight weeks, and I'm talking about the best surgeons and therapists in the world. The best ones, even those at the Mayo Clinic said, we need at least six to eight weeks. 
to get folk back on their feet. But the Bible says that this man who had been suffering from paralysis his entire life, 40 years to be exact, in moments from the time that miracle was proclaimed over him, he immediately begins to walk, which means that God gave him a stride. Now that don't mean nothing for those of y'all who've been walking your whole life. That don't mean anything for those of y'all who have been on a consistent pace. But I hear God telling somebody, you've been crawling long enough. You, you, you've been staggering long enough. I'm about to arch your back. I'm about to erect your posture. I'm about to straighten you up and you're about to stride. You about to have some wits about you. You're not going to stagger. You're not going to lean to the left or the right, but you're going to walk clearly. Is there anybody in here that says, God, I need my stride back. I dare you to lift up your voice and say, God, give me my stride. I don't want to keep stumbling over the same things. I don't want to keep tripping over myself. I don't want to keep tripping over my past mistakes. God, I need a stride. God, I need to walk like I know where I'm going. God, I need to walk like I know who empowers me. Is there anybody in here that says I may have staggered in here, but I'm a stride out of here. I may have struggled in the door, but I'm a stride out of here because greater is he that is in me than the he that is in the world. I'm gone. Bible says he got strength because he leaped. He got stability because he stood. And he received his stride because he walked. But that ain't even my sermon. I know y'all wondering why did I have this title? No experience required. Many of you have had jobs before and they had signs on the window that said no experience required. And the reason why they said no experience required is because they had the wherewithal within their organization to train their own employees. So all they need you to do was apply for the job. And once you applied, you would get all of the training that you needed. Well, this man had been lame for 40 years. He, he, he was not like Mephibosheth who used to walk and, and, was, and was given paralysis because some, somebody did something to him. This man had never walked. And the reason why it's so exciting is because he did not have any walking experience. He did not have any standing experience. He did not have any leaping experience. But when God got finished working a miracle in his life with no experience, the man began to leap. With no experience, the man began to stand. And with no experience, the man began to walk. I came to Cornelia Christian Church to tell somebody that the next season of your life, the season that you're standing at the precipice of, you won't need experience. I know somebody said you need a degree. Somebody said you need a resume. But I come to tell you that what God is getting ready to do, no experience required. I never had a father to show me how to be a dad. Don't worry about it, brother. No experience required. I never been a wife. I ain't never took care of another person. Don't worry, my sister. No experience required. I've never lived a holy life. I've never been a disciple. Need you not worry. Because now that you're in the house, no experience required. Is there anybody in here that says, God, I thank you that you didn't wait for me to get experience. God, I thank you that you called me and then you prepared me. God, I thank you 
that you sent me uh, and then you taught me uh, God I thank you uh, that you raised me up uh, and then you organized me uh, is there anybody in here uh, that says I'm so glad uh, that experience is not required I may not have the degree uh, but I've got the Holy Ghost uh, I may not have the experience uh, but I trust in Jesus uh, trust in the Lord uh, with all your heart uh, and lean not uh, to your own understanding uh, but in all your ways I said in all your ways uh, you ain't never been taught to be a CEO but you're about to run your own business. You ain't never been taught. You don't have experience with your own practice. But God says this is the season. You ain't never been a pastor before. But God says I'm about to train you myself. God says you've never done this or that. But by the grace of God. This is the word of God. For the people of God hear it and be saved you stay for the whole sermon the whole service congratulations I hope it bless you guys and if you if you were blessed share it with a friend and again guys if you were not here in person but you like to be a part of our worship experience through giving the options are on the screen we love for you to partner with us and if you've never been here live yo fix that problem here's what we do if you're from out of state and you are a faithful streamer here we'd love to pay for your hotel if you ever want to come here live we'd love to do that do it today um, schedule your plane ticket we got your hotel covered to come worship here at Cornelia Christian Church live and in living color God bless your whole life thank you for joining us today for worship